God is with us. Here we find new life. So good. So, so good. Just beautiful. Uh, thank you, Mark and Jim. Good morning and welcome to all of you to First Church of Christ in Simsbury. And Pastor George Harris, joined by my friend and colleague, Reverend Kevin Weichel. Uh, of course, Mark Mercier, Jim Martoccio. Um, I don't know how many of you um, would have seen this somewhere, but yesterday was Mark's birthday. So happy birthday, Mark. To celebrate that fact, somebody put up on Instagram, um, on a Max Creek post, um, a video of him when he was 26, <laughs> playing <laughs> a, a, a reminder uh, that he was uh, just as, um, I would say more maturely talented now, but, but obviously <laughs> gifted and talented back then as well. So it was uh, really, really nice to see. Um, we're, we're blessed to have you here for sure. Um, welcome to those of you who are worshiping in person. Also welcome to those who are streaming live with us at home, either on Facebook or on our uh, website. And uh, we are an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ. Uh, that means we seek to be intentional in our welcome, uh, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey. And if you happen to be new to the church or here for the first time or have only been here a couple times, uh, you might go on uh, either our website, uh, fccsimsbury.org, or, and or the UCC website, ucc.org, and just kind of read a little bit more about what we're all about. Um, just offer one more thing, that uh, this is the fifth of six Stewardship Sundays, part of our stewardship season here at First Church. And uh, that means that next Sunday is what we call our Commitment Sunday, kind of the, the, the finale, the, the climax of this season of stewardship. Um, we will be, again, um, inviting anyone who wants to come forward with their pledge a little bit later in this service. And so if you do not have a pledge card but would like to take that opportunity to pledge, uh, during the opening hymn, the ushers will kind of just move among the congregation with some pledge cards. And so if you would uh, like to, you could just kind of flag them down as they pass and make sure that you're equipped for that a little bit later in the service. Let us be together in prayer. In the midst of continual change, God remains steadfast in God's love for us. God is creating something new, a new heaven and a new earth. Each day offers newness of hope and faith. Let us open our hearts and spirits to God's creative word for us that we may learn, grow, and serve as effective witnesses to God's love and power. Amen. Please rise for the call to worship. God's promises are awesome. In the midst of difficulty, God gives us a word of hope. Something new is coming. We stand eagerly on tiptoes, awaiting God's new creation. Prepare your hearts to receive God's mighty blessing. Open our spirits and our hearts, Lord, to be ready to
Please be seated. As we do each week, we gather in this time, in this part of the worship service, to collect uh, the places where we fall short and to give them to God so that our hearts might be open to God's grace and mercy. So let us pray together our unison prayer of confession. O oh God, we are more like the vision in Luke than the vision of Isaiah. We see wars, hatred, violence everywhere, yet despair of every suffering man. We see oppression and injustice and persecution, but fail to raise our voices in pathetic protest. We have become a pessimistic people. Help us believe, really believe, in Isaiah's vision of a peaceable kingdom, in your promise of a new heaven and a new earth. Let your cry be our cry. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. Amen. Grateful for God's forgiveness we celebrate together that we are a forgiven people. Thanks be to God. Amen.
A reading from Isaiah chapter 63, verses 17 through 25. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. For no more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more shall there be an infant that lives but a few days, or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies in a hundred years will be considered a youth, and one who falls short of a hundred shall be considered a curse. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall be the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. We shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for there shall be offspring blessed by the Lord and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. Before they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together The lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy all on my holy mountain, says the Lord. One of the challenges in preparing any sermon is to identify illustrations that help interpret the Bible passage while also making connection with the lives of you who are listening. Now, sometimes this connection is obvious. Drawing from my experience, I might tell a story about the challenges of marriage that have you leaning in, nodding your head, and chuckling in recognition, at least for all the married people present. But other times an illustration requires a little work on your part and on mine. Though the illustration itself may be unfamiliar to you, I can guide you in making connections with your life today. And such is the case this morning. When I was in seminary from 2005 to 2007, there was an associate dean, a Methodist minister, Reverend Karen Oliveto. I took my introduction to worship class from Reverend Oliveto, and she was awesome. Though I don't remember a lot of specifics from the class, that's not her fault, that's just me. I definitely remember her profound faith and the importance she put on entering into our faith through our worship of God and her warmth. Reverend Oliveto had a relaxed and happy smile, nothing seems to phase her, which is remarkable, given what she would go through. And I think I have a pic. There she is. There she is. I partly share that because when I say, well, I'll go on to tell you that um, she became a bishop, and I didn't want you to picture her in the big pointy hat, because that's that's her right there. (laughs) Reverend Oliveto is a lesbian who has been with her wife, Robin, for over 20 years. And while this might seem unremarkable these days, 
In the Methodist Church, LGBTQ clergy are forbidden from being ordained. I believe she was ordained before she came out. Then in 2016, Reverend Oliveto, as I said, was elected a bishop in the United Methodist Church. A bishop. Now, of course, we don't have bishops in the UCC, but I don't need to tell you that that's a big deal. And we can only imagine that if LGBTQ people cannot be ordained in the Methodist Church, they certainly could also not be consecrated as a bishop. In fact, the Book of Discipline of the United Methodist Church specifies that a, quote, self-avowed practicing homosexual is excluded from these roles. And boy, don't those words just sound awful in and of themselves, not at all communicating uh, what Reverend Oliveto is as a child of God. But the Western jurisdiction of which she was a part didn't pay any mind to the Book of Discipline and elected her as a bishop anyway. Almost immediately, her election was challenged before a Methodist Judicial Council, which concluded that her consecration as bishop was unlawful according to Methodist law. Now, at this point, I get a little lost in the details. I know there were more juridical proceedings to follow, and I know that while she was not defrocked as a minister or a bishop and continued to serve in these roles, but that her ordination and consecration kind of remained out of order according to Methodist law. Again, I'm not exactly sure what that was all about. I say all this to make two points here. First, my intent here is not to bash the Methodist Church. I have always been deeply moved and inspired by the unique faith of Methodists. And I want us to imagine what all this was like for Bishop Oliveto, how personal that judgment by the church she loved must have felt. And here, this is what she said in response. In all things, we in the United Methodist Church try to reach just resolution, and that is where all parties agree on how to put to rest a complaint. That's what we're working toward, she said. I grow when I'm in relationship with people who don't believe the same thing I believe. That doesn't threaten me. In fact, it encourages my growth. So I have people in the Mountain Sky area who, don't, who aren't of one mind regarding the role of LGBTQ people in the life and ministry of the church, who actually question my validity as their bishop. But I am their bishop. I am committed to supporting their ministry. I am committed to hearing their relationship with Jesus Christ, and I want to grow with them. I find that remarkable. And the story doesn't end here. For the past several years, this question of the role of LGBTQ people in the Methodist Church has threatened the very life and existence of that church. As a worldwide church, they have tried to find common ground to bring faithful people of diverse perspectives together. When I say worldwide church, I mean that there are many Methodist churches in Africa and Asia. My Methodist colleagues love this about their church, love that they are in communion with diverse people around the world. Yet it is many of the representatives from these African and Asian churches that refuse to embrace proposed changes to make the church more open and affirming. After years long studies and votes and more studies and more votes, the Methodist Church has finally decided that it will split into two churches. The United Methodist Church will become welcoming to LGBTQ people and ordain LGBTQ clergy. And a new global Methodist Church will be established to represent so-called traditional values that continue to deny and exclude LGBTQ people. My Methodist friends and colleagues have been heartbroken by this decision, but have accepted it even as they grieve. Like the quote from Bishop, Bishop Oliveto that I shared, my friends and colleagues love the church united with its diversity, but there was going to be no place in that church for LGBTQ people and those who love them. So now every Methodist church is asked to choose whether to remain in the United Methodist Church or to leave to become part of this global Methodist church. I know that Simsbury Methodist down the street will remain 
in the United Methodist Church, but other churches throughout the United States and around the world are choosing to leave. It is heartbreaking indeed. So that's the story of conflict and division. Even if we are not Methodists, we can relate to some of the feelings. Of course, we are all witnesses to political divisions, even as we await final results of elections that are about as evenly divided as can be. But that's not where I'm going with this this morning. Remember I said at the beginning of this illustration that it will require some work from us in order to apply the lessons of the Isaiah passage to our lives today. So let us now turn to that passage, and in a moment I will lift up some things both from Bishop Oliveto's stories and that Isaiah text as well. Like the story of the Methodist Church, the context of chapter 65 of Isaiah is division. The leaders of Judah have been held in captivity and exile in Babylon for several generations before finally being allowed to return. While they were in exile, a remnant of Jews remained in Judah and its capital, Jerusalem, living and laboring under the occupying Babylonians. Now the leaders have returned, and they are in conflict with the remnant that had remained behind. God's words through Isaiah appear to be addressed primarily to the remnant, the most vulnerable, who had suffered the most during this time. Reading underneath each promise, of God, we get a sense of what the former times had been like. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard, suggests that there had been a lot of crying and pain. No more shall there be an infant that lives but a few days or an old person that does not live out a lifetime, implies that many Jews died prematurely in occupied Judah. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. Makes it clear that the remnant had labored for the Bab Babylonian occupiers without reaping the benefit of their labors. Now the leaders have returned from exile, maybe expecting that they will replace the Babylonians as the overseers of the remnant. God is promising that things will be different. Exiles and remnant will not necessarily agree the wolf will still be a wolf, the lamb a lamb, the lion and ox will both be present, but all shall feed together. Like Bishop Oliveto said, I grow when I'm in relationship with people who don't believe the same thing I believe. That doesn't threaten me, in fact, it encourages my growth. But it's interesting, isn't it? The deadly serpent has no place in this new heaven and new earth. Its food shall be dust. Those like the serpent who seek only to hurt and destroy shall be excluded from this realm of God. I said that we need to do a little work, both with this Isaiah text and the illustration of Bishop Oliveto and the Methodist Church. What are some of the common themes that we find in both these stories? Both of these stories are stories of love, faith, and relationship along with betrayal, suffering, and grief. The Jews love Israel just as Methodists love their unified church. Despite long suffering through experiences of betrayal and grief, both the Jews and the Methodists remain faithful to their God and their relationships. In both stories, the most vulnerable are promised protection and deliverance from their pain, but remain in relationship with those different than them. These are universal human experiences and emotions, aren't they? Love, faith, and relationship with betrayal, suffering, and grief. A desire for deliverance from pain along with restoration of our relationships, even possibly with those who have hurt us, the wolves and lions, but not those who seek only to hurt and destroy, not the serpents. Think about where these themes, these experiences and feelings are manifested in your life today. In your family, in your marriage, among your friends, in society judged for who you are. Where do you seek deliverance from your pain and restoration of your relationships? 
That's what God is speaking to through Isaiah. When we talked about this passage in Bible study this week, there was a sense that God's promise sounds great. But does God ever deliver on it? Either to the remnant of Israel or in the thousands of years since? Can we hope for such deliverance and restoration in our lives? Is there evidence of such deliverance and restoration in our lives? Yes, there is, and here is an example. I shared about the challenges that Bishop Oliveto has faced over decades. The ways her calls to lead the church as pastor and bishop have continually been judged and challenged in very personal ways. And the way the United Methodist Church she loves has experienced a schism over this question of the ordination of LGBTQ ministers. Well, last week, the Western jurisdiction of the newly constituted United Methodist Church elected three new bishops, a white woman, a Filipino-American man, and a gay black man, affirming the depth and breadth of God's love and God's creation and the church, and fully affirming LGBTQ clergy. Until last week, Bishop Oliveto had been the only LGBTQ bishop in the entire Methodist Church. After her years of love and betrayal, faith and suffering, relationship and grief, electing another gay bishop was liberating and restorative, both for Bishop Oliveto and the church. After that election, Bishop Oliveto posted this quote by Jody Skye Rogers on her Facebook page. Something profound happens when you wake up in a calm, green pasture on the other side of the treacherous storm that you thought would end you. You discover who you are beyond the unimaginable. You discover what you are made of. Suddenly, the thing that may have broken you becomes the very thing that empowers and emboldens you. That calm green pasture, the thing that empowers and emboldens you is the fulfillment of God's promise. For God is forever creating a new heaven and a new earth. Be glad and rejoice.
read it. Come together for this time here in worship where we share our concerns, our celebrations with one another. Concerns and celebrations of our lives, our church, and the community in the world. So, we pray comfort and strength and healing for Manny Siracus, who's dealing with heart and respiratory issues, uh, for Jim Trimble, as he deals with medical issues that prohibit him from traveling, and for Dave Wadhams, who had successful heart surgery uh, on Friday and is recovering well. It's a, it's a hard road, but he's, he's doing well. Um, we pray for our wider church community and world for, uh, for, for our country. In the uh, wake of the post-election frenzy, uh, we're rejoicing at wins and deflated by losses. We ask our newly elected leaders to do the hard work of securing freedom and justice for all and to transform the hearts of those who feel uh, threatened by indifference. And so what I ask now is for us to just take a moment to look over and pray over uh, the prayer list. It's found in your bulletin. Really look at those names and uh, be in silent prayer as you view the list. And then I'd ask what other names come to mind for you. And you can pray those in, in silence uh, or you can lift them aloud. Jim. This is good news. My uh, bonus daughter um, had a baby boy, baby Simon, uh, seven pounds, 12 ounces on Friday. And uh, all are doing well. Yes. And uh, yeah, so uh, the went doing very well. So. Well, congratulations on baby Simon. Yeah, Wonderful. Baby Simon. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Thanks, Danielle. And, um, and uh, yeah, she's doing very well. Awesome. Now you're Grandpa Jim. I'm Grandpa Jim. Yeah. Grandpa Jim. <laughs> Number six or seven. I don't know. I must know. <laughs> and you'll, you'll be doing whatever Simon says. Oh. <laughs> uh, sorry. Sorry. I apologize. <laughs> Next. What are the prayers? Yes. I talked to John Skinner yesterday mm -hmm. on the phone, and mm -hmm. he sends his love to a love and prayers to the congregation. Look forward to the day when they can be back. But they're going to step out and go take care of camp for the wedding first, for Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's a little apprehensive, but they're, they're looking forward to it. Prayers for the Skinners, uh, who have been through so much, um, you know, really weren't sure if Don was going to make it. And uh, so it's, it's beautiful that they're going to get to go on that trip. And I also want to just mention, that's what's so special about this congregation. You all check on one another, and that's just very cool. So thanks for doing that. Yes, yes. Luann. Prayers for Katie. Thank you. Kevin, you mentioned Manny Siracus. I was uh, able to visit. He's moved down to Niantic from Simsbury, and I was able to visit him on Friday. He's in rehab down there. Um, uh, made sure um, to tell me to send his regards to everyone. He said he misses uh, First Church and misses everyone here. Um, he's surrounded by family and friends down there, so he's being well cared for, but uh, I wanted to make sure I passed on his regards. The Lord be with you. I should mention um, Diana Woodbury's uh, service.
we, we continue to pray for, for Dane and his family, but her service is this uh, Saturday morning um, right here. So. Loving God, you are our creator, our sustainer, and when you open your hand, you satisfy the hunger, the thirst of every living thing. And so we look to you whenever we are in need, trusting in your love, your abundant goodness. We pray this morning for those who are spiritually hungry, those whose stomachs are empty. We pray for those who are suffering the effects of malnutrition and starvation. We pray for those who are empty emotionally, who are lonely, those who long for companionship and love, those caught in the grip of depression or overwhelmed by grief. We pray for those who are spiritually empty, who are troubled and don't know where to turn, those who long for purpose and for meaning and don't know where to look. Merciful one, life here on earth can be heartbreaking at times. We ask that you remind us to take notice of the beauty that surrounds us, even as we work to heal and hold fast to your promise to be with us, to renew us, to reconcile what is with the hope of what can be. Right now, may we breathe in that which brings life Right now, may love move us, protect us, keep us. Right now, may the weary find rest, the forgotten be remembered, and the suffering be stilled. We pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray these words, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. few announcements. Uh, after worship, the Gia Court team members are signing people up for the Power Assembly on December 7th. You saw that table out there on your way in. Um, you know, if, if you don't know much about the, the Gia Assembly, you know, just listen to what they have to say about it. It's a way to make a meaningful uh, difference uh, in uh, our state, along with other churches who come together um, to make change and create change. Um, also, out there is a table where you saw Latoya on your way in. She was sitting. It's a holiday mission project that the church school is putting on and that is going through December 7th so make sure you see LaToya about that and then also uh, Friday night supper is this Friday November 18th in this room it's monthly and it's a beautiful thing as church members and community members come together uh, for a meal I'd like now to uh, Pastor George is going to come up and introduce uh, our stewardship moment So I realized almost too late for this stewardship season that um, somebody would stand up here and make an extraordinarily powerful um, testimony about their giving to the church. And then I would stand up and say something kind of dreadful and tedious and, and boring afterwards. And I would, um, uh, with no intention of mansplaining, I would end up kind of mansplaining. And um, so I'm going to say my words here and then introduce the stewardship moment so the full effect of that can be uh, present with all of you. So um, a few things. I mentioned in the, in the greeting that um, this is the fifth of six Sundays. Next Sunday is our Commitment Sunday. So if you not, have not yet had an opportunity to uh, submit your pledge, please either do that today, this week, or next Sunday. Um, 
Do we have the thermometer, Jonathan? Can we, can we, oh, there it is, just right on cue. So, I mean, this is fantastic, 65%, right? $527,048 toward our goal of $815,000. Um, so that's extraordinary. And uh, given that we have another week left um, to get our pledges in, that's still kind of a ways to go before we get there. So once again, uh, celebration. Thank you to all who have pledged, um, rejoicing in <clears throat> the, this incredible generosity that is witnessed here. And if you have not yet, please uh, submit that as soon as you are able. Uh, following the stewardship moment, we will invite you to again come forward to our tithing box. I will once again say you could either submit your pledge card, you could submit the little slip of paper that say you give electronically, you could put a weekly pledge in, or you could simply uh, remain prayerfully in your seat. So um, all options are available to you. Um, I'm gonna, uh, the next speaker is speaking via video this morning because um, she uh, had to be with family out of state today. Her name is Jessica Hickey. Uh, she does a very, very good job introducing herself and her relationship with the church. Um, I would just say again, she mentions the GIA Power Assembly, and that is uh, sort of what Bill and Susan White here will be uh, offering to you as you exit out there in the, um, the vestibule. So please uh, pause on your way out and uh, visit with them. That's uh, another way that we give. In addition to our pledges, we give through our, uh, the things we do in the life of the church. Uh, now let's hear what Jessica has to say. Chip moment, a bit about what Fresh Church means to me. Good morning, First Church. My name is Jessica Hickey. I apologize for not being with you in person, as time with my family has pulled me out of the state. But I thank you for giving me the opportunity to share with you during this stewardship moment, a bit about what Fresh Church means to me. In 2017, I had a newborn and a three-year-old. As my son Austin began asking more questions about death and God, I realized I wanted to give them both the gift of a formal faith background. It had been years since I'd attended church regularly. After being put off by the lack of acceptance my previous pastor demonstrated towards members of the LGBTQ community. After looking around for a church community that valued inclusivity, I began attending First Church. I started with the early services in the chapel and was immediately drawn in by Pastor George's sermons, sharing stories of the Bible while offering the opportunity to interpret those stories in ways that made sense to the individual. As someone trying to find a church that fit my beliefs, that spoke to me. And let's be honest, who couldn't be drawn in by Jim Martoccio and Mark Mercier's musical offerings? <laughs> My, quickly, my family moved to the 10 a.m. service, and both of my children became part of the church school family. Austin and Lillian were baptized at First Church in 2018. It was two years later, in 2020, when COVID shut everything down, that I realized how connected they were to the church. Lillian repeatedly asked when she could go back to her church class. It was the number one thing that she missed during the lockdown. Before everything shut down, however, I had another opportunity to connect with members of First Church. In the fall of 2019, when it was announced that First Church was going to attend the GIA Founding Assembly and was looking to bring as many people as possible, my interest was piqued. An organization in Greater Hartford looking to make actual changes that would impact social justice related issues? I wanted to see what it was all about. So along with, I believe, about 80 of you, I headed off. I learned for the first time about issues related to welfare liens, criminal justice reform, and slumlords in the Hartford area. I heard GIA leaders get commitments from legislators, which led to actual change in laws. Among other things, I heard 10 superintendents from local school districts commit to racial justice training for staff. When Pastor George asked me a few months later if I'd like to join First George First Church's core team, I knew that this was something I wanted to do. For the first time in probably my life, I saw a way to be part of something that was making a real change in justice-related issues. 
a part of something that would let me put my privilege to work for my own benefit as well as the greater good. I met other members of the First Church GIA Corps team for the first time through regular Zoom meetings. We worked to further our own understandings through trainings of how to organize for action and strategies for dismantling injustice. We grew in community with one another through one-on-one -on -one meetings, a book study, and our work. Today, the GIA organization has grown to about 50 faith institutions. That's churches, mosques, synagogues, and community groups. And my involvement has grown as well. After hundreds of house meetings across the greater Hartford area, many of which you all graciously participated in, GIA leaders com combed through pages and pages of notes and determined the areas that were having the greatest negative impact on the community. Those became the next slate of GIA issues, of issues that GIA is working on to impact. They include gun violence, housing, mental health, environment, and my personal passion as a teacher, education. Currently, I'm serving on GIA's educational leadership team. As we begin the process of determining the most effective way GIA can influence positive changes impacting education in the greater Hartford area, I'm thankful for the opportunity to be of service and be a part of a group that's already made a difference in our area. I'm excited as well for the upcoming GIA Power Summit on December 7th on the CCSU campus, where leaders will launch new issue campaigns, obtain legisl legislative commitments, welcome new members, and experience the power and community of an interfaith choir. The First Church core team is hoping that we can be joined by no less than 100 others from our First Church community. First Church's membership in GIA has given me a way to connect with members of First Church and to be of service to myself, to my community, and to God. I give, I give to First Church as a way to sustain the church in all of its missions. I hope that you will join me in doing so as well. I hope that you will join me on December 7th for the GIA Power Summit. And who knows, maybe the way First Church impacts your life will continue to grow and develop as well. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Jessica. And we will now receive this morning's offering.
Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Gracious and loving God, for these gifts and pledges and tithes and offerings, we give you thanks. We ask your blessing upon them now. We dedicate them to your church so that your church might make a, a difference in our community and world. It's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. So before I pray us out, I do want to just say a couple more brief words about that uh, GIA Power Assembly on December 7th. If you were listening to Jessica in the video, she said a couple things. We hope to bring 100 of our members. Um, someone was foolish enough to, to blurt out that number in a Zoom meeting, um, um, wanting, to, wanting to make us look like a wonderful like the best church, I guess, is what, I, what I'm trying to say. And so I just kind of blurted it out. And so we're, we're kind of on the hook. So let me just say a couple things. That's more than all our, our die-hard social justice people. Um, um, it really, I encourage all of you, it's two hours from 7 to 9 on December 7th. Um, it's, it's just a great thing to come check out. Just come check it out, see what it's all about. It's an energetic, enthusiastic event, very well choreographed, and so it would be well worth your time. Um, Jessica said something else in that video. Um, oh yeah, there's an interfaith choir. <laughs> Mark. <laughs> um, um, uh, more to come, but it would be great if we were represented in that interfaith choir, so um, whatever cross-section of you are able to make it. Uh, my, my understanding is it will be um, uh, not a whole lot of preparation. Probably something very brief the evening of and then singing something relatively simple together. So uh, if you would plant that seed as well. Now, please, good people, may the spirit of the living God made known most fully to us in Jesus Christ go before you to show you the way, go above you to watch over you, go behind you to nudge you into places you might not go by yourselves, go beneath you to uphold and uplift you, go beside you to be your strong and constant companion, and dwell within you that you may know that you are never, ever alone, and that you are loved, loved beyond your wildest imagination. And may the fire of God's blessing burn brightly upon you and within you today and always. Amen. <laughs>